What's up, guys? Thank you for joining me for PLO Tips for Busy Grinders number 38. Today, we're going to be going over an interesting hand history that I uh, got from the 2 plus 2 forums, which I'll bring over here briefly so we can share player reads and go through it together. Um, but I also linked to this in the email. Now, in honor of uh, our newest product, 3-Bet Pots Game Theory and Practice Unexploitable Strategies for Beating Tough Games. I'm doing a 3-Bet Pot today uh, where we're going over uh, a spot where we're basically, uh, we're faced with an interesting turn and river decision. But nonetheless, uh, if you want to learn more about the 3-Bet Pots Game Theory and Practice book, you can check it out uh, in the description below here. Now, let's look at this. So it's 5-10 PLO. It's an eight-handed game. Everyone is super deep. There's a lot of action, as he describes. He says it's not really fishy, but there's pretty big action with decent players who aren't afraid to shoot. So we're under the gun. Ace, queen, 10, three, double suited, raised to 40. Um, so basically, I'm just going to go over the player reads, and then we'll get to the action in a second. So under the gun, two is the weakest player in the game. Uh, loose pre, straightforward in multi-way pots, button, stuck a bunch, of, and is on tilt. Big Blind is a player who um, is good, but is on massive tilt because he made a bad call earlier, just had a huge tournament score, so really is kind of in spew mode. Those are the uh, relevant reads in the hand. So we opened to 40 under the gun, uh, cutoff calls, button calls, um, and then the Big Blind squeezes to 210. Now, uh, I want to make a note. I think that being this deep, it's fine to call here. Um, but in general, I think that this is a spot where a lot of players overcall. Uh, I think that especially with a hundred big blinds, um, it's really tricky to turn a profit here when you're calling with a lot of hands facing a squeeze with bad relative position. Now, the main reason is because when you flop nothing, you basically can never bluff because you have p players behind you. Um, and when you have something good, a lot of times you have to just jam over the C bet or bet large when checked to and sort of announce your hand. So whenever you're faced with a preflop decision, in general, um, you know the, you have to be getting laid a pretty good price uh, in order to call and just basically like hand mine or pair mine or set mine or nut flush draw mine, whatever you want to call it. Um, in general, the profit, the big, the greatest profit scenarios in preflop situations are spots where you can both make money from bluffing and also make money from uh, making a hand and value betting it. So in situations where like you basically are only calling to hit, um, you need to be getting laid a pretty good price and you also have to have something nutty if you have bad position. Uh, so, you know, you see a lot of hands, uh, a lot of players uh, kind of over calling with hands like king, queen, nine, seven, for example, in this kind of situation pre um, that are just negative EV, EV calls. So uh, in six max more so, I see it happen a lot uh, where players will um, like open the cutoff with again a hand let's say like king queen nine seven or something like that button will call and then the big blind will squeeze and it's like well you're dominated by the squeezing range you're out of position to the other player your hand flops a medium strength hand um, really frequently it's hard to like get it in good with a king queen nine seven on most flops so this is a spot where I find a lot of players losing money but in this scenario I think I'm okay with the call I mean we're deep we have a hand that plays well when deep so um and there's the fishy player behind us so i'm fine with the call we do make the call everyone calls uh the flop is jack 10 4 rainbow we flop middle pair a gut shot some back doors flop checks through turn is a five of clubs which is a beautiful card for us it gives us a gut shot it gives us the nut flush draw um so now we have a double gutter the nut flush draw and middle pair and the tilted good player bets 650 into 850 and we're left with a decision basically of whether we want to peel or we want to raise now what are the important factors to consider in in this hand first i would consider how big if if basically our, our only options are to call or to semi bluff and here's the, what i would consider first i would consider the bet sizing i might be a lot more prone to just call if the villain potted it I think that um, this is more of like a general merged sizing. It doesn't have to be exactly uh, Jack 10 plus. Um, I, and, you know, he squeezed pre, so 
I think he's going to have a lot more big cards even when somebody's steamed. In general, even steamed players, um, you know, when they have the option to easily take a flop when they're closing the action, their squeezing range is going to be pretty tight. So I still want to weight it towards big cards. Now, uh, the second question to ask is how big can we make it? Uh, in this scenario, we can make it, uh, let's see, 18... We can make it pretty big. We can make it almost 3,000. So um, if we were in a situation where, like, uh, the biggest we could make it was min, right? Like, we could only min raise this player, and you knew that he was never folding. I might be more apt to call and bring in the other players behind. But the fact is, um, the flop checked through. I could see how the big blind would be putting out a stab or think that he was safe to put out a stab with hands like, um, let's say... Uh, 10 king queen x ace king queen x um ace 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 three something like that i can just see a lot of different merged hands that um may actually bet fold this now most importantly you can see that we have a ton of equity against the range that we've uh, assigned this player and as you can see i gave him a three bet of 10 percent, which is i think pretty generous i mean we can make it a little bit tighter if we want but i think that someone who's stuck um you know, might be prone to be more aggressive. But even if we, let's say that we gave him a little bit tighter of a percentage. Uh, one sec. Delete that. Um, so we're still doing pretty pretty good against his range, as you'll see here in a second. Yep. So um, I prefer potting it. I think that with so much equity against a range uh, and having enough behind to make a big enough bet in order to make him fold is pretty important. Um, I If he potted it, I think I would just call, almost always. I just don't think that um, against a potting range, we do nearly as well. But I think against the type of range that I'm talking about, we do significantly better. We have a much higher fold equity. And in general, when I have like, you know, 30, 35% uh, actual pot equity, it's... You know, if you think that you have any, you really barely need any type of fold equity to make it a profitable um, pot. So I would pot it here. Um, additionally, you know, there is merit in bringing the other players behind, but I would want actually like a stronger hand to bring them behind. Like, I honestly think that if I had a hand like, let's say, Jack, Jack, Ace, Queen with the nut flush draw, that might be a hand where I'm willing to slow play and let players come behind. But with a hand like this, where um, our hand is still pretty vulnerable to a lot of the player's range, and we benefit a lot from him folding and just taking down the pot, I prefer potting. But we do decide to call, and everyone calls. <clears throat> so now we're faced with an interesting river decision. Um, in the post, he says that the, vil the villain asks the dealer how much is in the pot and bets twenty two fifty. So there's a couple of things that concern me here. One is the two players behind. Like especially given how loose they are, I don't think it's outrageous to, to see them having like fives full <laughs> or ten some weird 10-5 combination. Who knows, right? Like, I think that I, I definitely can see them showing up with a boat. I think the two, there's two important questions here to ask. One is, why did he choose 2250? Um, it could be he was trying to look stronger. It could be that he just wanted to bet like a good value betting size. It's really tough to say without knowing the opponent. Um, but what we can look at on its face is the odds we're getting, you know, um, <clears throat> getting two, two and a half to one, essentially. And another primary question is, is he ever value betting worse? Now, it would be terrible. It would be a terrible mistake to fold, obviously, if you think that he's value betting any 10, especially since we've put a lot of rundowns in his squeezing range pre. If he's value betting any 10, then you, then you have to call. Um, if you don't think that your villain is value betting a 10, um, then it's closer to a fold. Uh, but I think that given that he's stuck, <clears throat> given the price that we're getting, I'm not sure we can fold here. Um, this is also one of the benefits of being in a live setting. I would tank. I would try to get a read on the players behind, um, spend some time seeing if they're checking out of the hand or if they're going to call. The reverse side of that is if you're one of the players in the cutoff of the button and you just fill it up on the river, it's important to look like you're checking out um, so that you can actually get some calls um, and extra value out of your hand, especially if you can tell that like under the gun is struggling with the decision. I think it's close. I don't hate calling. 
I don't hate folding. It depends on your reads and the opponent, but the most, what you need to develop in these types of situations is some type of like threshold hand, which is for me, trip tens. Like if he's value betting any trip 10 combination, then you need to call. Um, if he's not, you need to just think about um, if your opponent is capable of bluffing in a spot like this. Um, certainly he's not going to, in my opinion, going to turn like Kings into a bluff aces into a bluff, but I can see some other type of rundown hands that he may turn into a bluff. So my gut says lean towards a call. Um, but I think that the most important, uh, takeaway from this hand was the turn. Um, the other aspect of the turn, let's go back to it real quick. The other aspect of the turn is if you do have players behind who, let's say they turned four five, which I think, you know, given how loose he said they are, um, Let's say, <clears throat> let's say that they turned four five, uh, or they turned like some weird ten five combination. They're gonna fold that if you jam. So um, in situations where you have a ton of equity against basically everything, and you have some fold equity, um, I would take it. <clears throat> 